Ukraine has been granted European Union candidate status after applying in the days following the Russian invasion. The decision was announced earlier this evening, prompting the Ukrainian president Vladimir Zelensky to welcome the decision. However, candidate status is just the first step towards EU membership, and this could take many, many years uh, to uh, see the country fully join the EU. To get a sense of, of how this is going down in Ukraine, I've been speaking to the former Deputy Minister for European Integration in the country, Sergei Petikov, who's been telling me what the move could mean for Ukrainians. I was thrilled to learn that um, the, the, the leaders of the European nation reached this unanimous conclusion of granting the candidate stages to Ukraine and Moldova. And I think this is a uh, feeling shared by most of Ukrainians because it's uh, first a very symbolic act and also sends a clear uh, long-term message that Ukraine belongs to the European family and that uh, we will be one day part of the European Union. You say one day. Candidate status is, is only the first step in a very long process, which could take years. Is there more to this than symbolism? Well, it is, it is important because even a year ago, uh, no one in Europe was prepared to even put on paper the prospect of Ukraine becoming uh, a EU member state, given a clear European perspective. So while we had a deep and comprehensive trade agreement and overall an association with the EU, it was not officially confirmed that Ukraine will one day or might one day become an EU member. So it's a huge step forward. And while it's, uh, of course, not guaranteed and the timeline you know, is not set, I think we are on the right path. And uh, domestically, both the people and, you know, the parties of all the political sector will do what, they, what is required to get closer to the EU in the foreseeable future. And yet there are conditions attached to that, which include judicial and anti-corruption reforms, uh, unlikely to see any movement while the war continues. Now, well, some of those conditions can be fulfilled easily. For example, we've had uh, an open selection for the anti-corruption prosecutor, and there's a winner uh, that is, uh, remains to be announced. So this can be done easily, notwithstanding the war. There was just simply no political will to do that. Some other things can also be done even at, during this time. Um, other things are a bit more complicated, of course, and uh, it will not be possible during the acute you know, uh, part of, of the war. But I think that uh, it's just that's the agenda, which, um, which many people will agree domestically is something that needs to be reformed in Ukraine. And uh, we, we are looking at, um, you know, the war to end and the government continuing with the reform path that it has been uh, doing for the last several years. Which in itself could take many years. Uh, how does the work begin whilst the war continues? Can it begin whilst the work, war continues? No, I mean, I don't think that anyone expects uh, that this candidacy, uh, this decision today will lead to a swift EU membership for Ukraine. I think we, we are realistic over here. We do know that it will take a lot of reform domestically. It will depend on the political situation and the war with Russia. Uh, but we also see the example of Cyprus that has become an EU member while having one third of its territory occupied. Um, we also uh, have, an, have an understanding that uh, we will continue as a democratic state, state notwithstanding the external threats and we will continue you know, with the uh, de uh, democratic elections and rule of law and then uh, reforming the judiciary for it to become independent. So I think we will have to come up with a small way of being strong uh, externally, but still keeping the you know, political pluralism and uh, independence of the judiciary domestically. But I think it's, it's quite possible. I mean, some states managed to do that. And our president referred to Israel, for example, as one of the examples of a state that uh, remains democratic, even um, in, in the face of the external existential threat. Speaking uh, just last week, President Putin said he had nothing against EU uh, ca candidacy status for, for Ukraine. Um, I wonder, though, how concerned you are about how Russia will actually react to this development. 
No, we do know that they will react negatively. Uh, they they send uh, conflicting messages. I think um, well, they once stated that you know they are against uh, the NATO membership for Ukraine, but they're not against EU membership. Then they've changed their position, saying, well, actually, uh, EU also has its defense cooperation, which we see as also kind of a threat for Russian interests, and therefore we know against EU membership for Ukraine. I think they're, they're, uh, once in a while uh, they claim as if they don't care, just to mask how disappointed they are. And we've seen that from the messages coming from Russian propaganda, uh, which uh, was pretending to say that you know, Ukraine will be fooled by Europe Europe does not want and does not see Ukraine as uh, as equal partner. It's only you know using Ukraine to fight Russia, and they will fight until the last Ukrainian. So it does show that Russia did care. And uh, given that you know this decision of granting the candidacy for Ukraine was expected pretty much since the um, statements of the EU public officials. Um, you know, during this week and last week, I think they're just trying to save their face, saying that, well, we actually don't care, just to, you know, just not to show their disappointment with the political loss. Just, just to reflect on, on the, uh, the signal valuing of this, what message do you believe it, it sends to the Kremlin? No, um, I, I think that it's a powerful message to the Kremlin that Europe is serious about Ukraine. It's not... Uh, a tactical move right now. It's not something that can be reversed. It's not something that is uh, about economic interests of individual EU member states. It's a strategic uh, interest of Europe having uh, a Ukraine as an independent European nation with a rule of law and democracy and part of the EU and European family. And in this way, this shows to Russia that uh, Europe is going to stand for its values. Uh, it will, uh, you know, sustain the economic uh, damage that that is imposed by Russia right now by cutting the gas supplies to Europe, and it will stand by Ukraine both in terms of economic help, uh, political assistance, and uh, supply of necessary weapons in order to protect the choice of Ukrainian people. And I think that's a very powerful signal for Russia and Russian people. Because they will be seeing this and as an example of, you know, uh, a country that you know can be successful and democratic, and uh, having you know peaceful and good relations with its uh, European neighbours. Is it likely to have any immediate impact on Russia's blockade on grain exports in Ukraine? Um, I don't expect this to have an immediate uh, effect on the Russian, you know, other uh, the, the conduct of the war in Donbas or elsewhere for the blockade of, of the Ukraine. I think it's just a part of a bigger picture that is becoming clear to not only Putin, but also oligarchs who support him, that, um, it, you know, this war cannot be ended by the Russians winning or even a kind of a um, ceasefire that will uh, lead to most of the sanctions lifted within the nearest future. I think that will... Uh, show, send a signal to many, many in the Russian elite that uh, whatever they've been doing will not have a clear winning outcome for them. So they will have to reconsider the strategy. Um, the negotiations on deblocking the Ukrainian wheat experts uh, are ongoing in Turkey. Um, I, I cannot really foresee whether they will be successful in the you know near future. But I think it's important that you know the the whole. Um, picture, the big picture, is that in a sense that you know, Europe will stand behind Ukraine, it will sustain economic damage, it will be united in the face of Russian aggression, and no uh, separate you know, negotiations are possible, and no, you know, you, whatever concerns Ukraine will be decided by Ukrainians with the assistance of the European nations, something that we can do like. He likes talking to big guys and not really talking to you know, the smaller nations that he things as not really independent. Just a final thought on, on the timeline here. Do we have any clarity on when accession negotiations perhaps might start? No, well, even even getting to the accession uh, negotiations will be a, a huge back step because it's not an automatic process. You know, recognition of the candidate state, it does not mean that the negotiations on accession will start immediately. And the commission has said seven uh, requirements that are to be met in order to even 
start thinking about, you know, the next step of accession negotiations, they will be evaluated by the end of the year. And uh, the, the Vice Prime Minister already stated that she believes that Ukraine will be able to fulfill the seven uh, requirements by the end of the year. Let's see if that happens. Uh, and if Ukraine will show uh, considerable progress on those seven areas in rule of law and fighting corruption, I think that the political decision to open the accession negotiations will follow, given that uh, Ukrainians have shown uh, their willingness to stand for European values and for their choice. So I, I do believe if these technical things will, will be uh, implemented, the EU nations will recognize that Ukraine has fulfilled both political and technical requirements for the next step, which is accession. And just a final point on that. You, you say uh, European values in Ukraine. And what, what are those values? No, it's many things. And I think, again, this has been used by Russian propaganda in a negative sense uh, because uh, this, this is uh, a, a clear difference between Ukrainian society and Russian society, which are tolerance, uh, respect for the ethnic minorities, respect for the you know, um, equality of genders, uh, and uh, equal protection for LGBT people and um, you know, um, freedom of speech, freedom of, of um, thought, freedom of peaceful assembly. So these are all things that are quite normal in, in European societies, but something that are alien to Russian society. And uh, part of the reason for this attack against Ukraine is that Russian, uh, that Putin is afraid that if the Russian society sees that Ukraine can prosper under this uh, democratic values, uh, that will stand an example for the Russian society that has not seen this uh, coming or happening. And will sort of what he's uh, always afraid is that he will see a Maidan a popular uprising uh, along the lines of Ukrainian uprisings somewhere in Moscow or St. Petersburg. So uh, these are the values that uh, you know, we all take for granted in Europe uh, that he... Uh, you know, and, and the Russian establishment is seen as alien to well, he, what he believes, you know, the former Soviet Union countries belonging to the Russian world, as he called it. So again, these are the European values uh, that are enshrined in our human rights documents and, and constitutions of most European countries uh, that, are, that are really important to Ukrainian people. That's why they were, uh, you know, uh, protesting against the rigged elections or, or, or attempts to include Ukraine like Belarus in the sphere of Russian influence. Sergei Pechikov speaking to me earlier there, the former Deputy Minister for European Integration of Ukraine, and uh, speaking to me is the news that Ukraine has been granted European Union candidate status has been announced. Uh, that's after the country applied in the days following Russia's invasion.